A lot of people, when drafting in fantasy football, get over-infatuated with what happened last year or fancy names and things that aren't repeatable, okay? And the problem with going too heavy into what happened last year is that you take this sample size of 16 games, 17 games, and you think that that is the norm for all of these players. When a lot of the times you have two similar players, statistically, athletically, and more importantly, in similar situations, but something just didn't break right for one player and it broke right for the other player, meaning this guy finished as the RB7, this guy finished as the RB27, whereas this upcoming year, everything is the same, except we want to factor in luck. We want to factor in all this, this nonsense, okay? So what I'm here to talk to you all about today is some really don't like the word arbitrage. It's so overplayed and overused, but that's kind of what we're doing today. We're talking about maybe POV plays, point of view, right? We're going to POV a player that looks like one player, but is actually another player. That's what we're going to call it, the POV plays today. So if you're thinking about drafting one of these specific running backs in fantasy football at their current ADP, I'm going to give you a prototype player, extremely similar situations going much later in drafts. All right. Sound good? Sound Gucci? Y'all know what to do next. Let's tuck our shirts in. Let's stop yelling. Let's eat. So first up on this list, I hinted at this swap in the mock draft that I did on Sunday. Now, if you want to mock draft with me, the easiest way is to jump in our Discord. It's completely free, and the link is right in the description. Come in, talk fantasy football with us, talk about draft strategy, talk about margaritas, talk about anything you want. Links down there. I drop the links to these sleeper drafts, the mock drafts that I do in there. Again, completely free. Don't hurt to join. Don't hurt to try it out. You hate me? Get out. I don't care. But the first swap I hinted at, and y'all going to need to hear me out, listen to the argument here, is Joe Mixon, currently the RB7, pick 13.4, this uh, this ADP is per underdog, some of the sharpest in the industry. Joe Mixon, RB7, 13th overall. Don't draft him. Draft Josh Jacobs at running back 22, 62nd overall. And I say this a lot. When I'm looking at running backs that I want to draft, if I'm talking about the top of the draft, they need to bring a few traits to the table that give them the overall upside of being you know, the RB1 overall, the RB2 overall. And it's some sort of combination between catching passes, right, getting a lot of targets, being in a good offense that affords a lot of scoring opportunities, getting a lot of volume, very obvious things. But when you start taking out some pieces, you need the other pieces to fall into place. Otherwise, there's no upside there. Now, Joe Mixon, he's an example of a player that doesn't catch a lot of passes, but was so good last year because his offense afforded him a lot of scoring opportunities. A lot of the times you see the RB1 overall finish as, you know, the Todd Gurley, the Christian McCaffrey, those guys who are going to catch 70 or 80 plus passes in a year. Easy to see why they finish that way. Then every once in a while you have the Derrick Henrys, the Adrian Petersons, the guys who don't catch a lot of passes, but they get a ton of early down volume and they're in really good offenses, affording them a lot of scoring opportunities. Obviously those guys have big, big time breakaway ability, which I don't think either of these backs have, but similar argument. Okay. So if you're not catching passes, you need to be in a very good offense with a lot of early down volume. So what changed for Mixon from years one to four, where we looked at him as, you know, he had a couple good years, kind of mediocre back. We're starting to like fade away from him. And then year five, this previous year, why did he just take the jump up to being elite? And I'd argue that he, he didn't right in 2018, he had 1,464 yards from scrimmage in 14 games. The next year he had 1,424 total yards and he's had nine touchdowns in eight touchdowns in those years, 4.9 yards per carry, 4.1 yards per carry in 2021, 1,500 yards from scrimmage. So very similar to those other years, 4.1 yards per carry from 2018 to 2022, he averaged 3.5 targets per game. Last year, he averaged three targets per game. He didn't get any more passing work. The only thing that changed with Mixon was that he scored 16 touchdowns in 2021. He had the exact same role, the exact same pass catching role. The team was just way better and afforded him way more scoring opportunities. The Raiders are going to be nice this year on offense with Devontae Adams in the lineup. On top of them being a better offense because Devontae Adams is in there, right? Darren Waller missed a lot of time last year as well. They're playing in a division where they're going to need to play fast pace. They're going to need to score a lot of points, right? KC, it's Denver, it's LA. Like there is no letting up in that division. That's six games right there off the rip. So the way I look at it is, listen, obviously straight up, you want Joe Mixon over Josh Jacobs. But 
you'd be hard pressed not to objectively look at the situation and say that they're not similar players. And you look at Joe Mixon as an elite option right now because, because he scored a lot of touchdowns. Josh Jacobs has been a good touchdown scorer, right? He's had eight, nine, I think even 12 in his career. And this year might be the best offense that he's played in. So I would say Josh Jacobs, even if he gets his passing work peeled back a little bit, which he was pretty fucking high up in last year, 62, 70 targets, something like that. He could break off a, a mixing type scoring year. He could have 14, 15 touchdowns. And I think you all need to reconsider Josh Jacobs at running back 22, at pick 62 in the sixth round. It's hard to get excited about him, but the better he's the type of player that we know who he is, right? The better the offense is, the better he's going to be in fantasy. And it's lined up to be a pretty fucking good offense. The second running back up on this list. Instead of drafting Kareem Hunt's RB32, pick 97, draft Melvin Gordon, RB35, pick 108. So a full round later. Like this this matchup couldn't make more sense if I tried. We have two backup running backs who are the 1Bs on their team to a much younger, better, more explosive running back ahead of them. And I would say Melvin is the only one here in a really, really legit offense with a shot to actually split the carries like 50-50. Both of them are probably going to get 10 11, 12 carries a game. Both of them are going to split the pass catching duties. Both of them are probably going to split the goal line duties. I would say Melvin Gordon probably has a better chance to even get goal line duties. And without Watson, again, like the offensive side of things, if, if it's Jacoby Brissett the whole year, you want a Russell Wilson-led offense over a Jacoby Brissett-led offense. So Devon's offense is going to the fucking, it's going to outer space. It's going to Jupiter. So if you're going to take a backup running back, make it Melvin Gordon, not Kareem Hunt, later in the draft. Number three on this list, and this one is a really interesting one that I was surprised I even found myself thinking about this second player. If you're going to draft Clyde Edwards Hilaire at running back 26, 78th overall, which I fucking, I, I can't, I can't find something more disgusting in the ADP right now. Don't draft Devin Singletary running back 33, 106 overall. At this point in his career, CEH, we're not sure what he's even good at other than being a Kansas City Chiefs running back. Legitimately, I don't know what he's good at in the NFL level. It's like, maybe he's a good runner, but like up to this point, probably not. He hasn't really shown anything on the ground. Probably not getting a ton of goal line carries there because he's not the biggest running back on the roster whatsoever. And sure, he'll be in a high scoring offense, but they also just signed Ronald Jones. He's going to get more work than anybody wants to see happen this year. They brought by Jarek McKinnon, who's blew up last year. One Clyde got back and they were ready in the playoffs. Jarek McKinnon averaged 17 opportunities per game throughout their playoff run. They very much plan to use Jarek McKinnon in a similar, a lesser, but similar-ish role to last year. So you want a running back in a great offense, but you don't actually know how valuable their touches are going to be or what they're actually good at at this point. Why draft Clyde edwards Lair 30 picks before Devin Singletary? Buffalo Bills offense, better than the Kansas City Chiefs offense. Singletary completely took over that backfield last year, whereas Clyde edwards Lair did not. Moss became an afterthought. So Moss is almost like a worse version of Ronald Jones when it comes to fantasy. James Cook is probably about Jarek McKinnon-esque, right? James Cook's going to have his role. Of course, he's going to catch some passes this year, but again, he's a rookie. He's not going to take over the backfield right away. He's an undersized rookie. He's under 200 pounds. James Cook will probably play the two-minute, the four-minute role, maybe a little bit of early down work, but I don't see too much coming out of it. I think the overall sentiment here is like, they're eerily similar. I don't like Clyde at all. I don't really like Devin Singletary at all either, but if you're going to go with Clyde, just don't and take Singletary 30 picks later. They're super similar, super similar offenses, situations, players, opportunities, all the same. But realistic, I probably don't want either of them. Just don't take Clyde this year, please. Number four. This one. This one's a fun one. This one's a fun one. If you're going to take Najee Harris in the first round at running back five, don't. Take Leonard Fournette instead. RB11, 23rd overall. We could play a POV here. A picture of this. POV. You're the 225-pound workhorse for your team. I know both of them have gotten fat. Let's try that again. POV. You're the 258-pound workhorse running back for your team. You play on all three downs. You caught around 70 passes out of the backfield last year. You handled almost all of your team's 10 zone and goal line work last year. You were just an all-around awesome fantasy player. Y'all are thinking of Najee Harris when I'm thinking of Lenny Fournette fitting all of those bills. Najee will be fine this year, right? He's not a guy I don't want on my fantasy team. Like, is this offense going to be good, though? If Trubisky starts, does that mean fewer dump-offs to the running back? Does that mean more rushes for the quarterback, which results in both fewer that and fewer rushes for the for the running back altogether and one thing like I really really stress we cannot forget about last year when it comes to Najee's receiving numbers and this is where like the website that I plugged on Tuesday's video Tuesday's video was how to become a better fantasy football player in five minutes it was a really quick video where I showed you uh, my top six favorite resources that I use to do research and the first one I listed on there was FF today I will link that video so you can watch it next and on the end screen and 
until I went to that site and actually looked at Najee's game logs last year, I had forgot about the fact that in week three, Najee Harris saw 20% of his targets and receptions against Cincinnati in that game. He had 19 targets and 14 catches in week three against Cincinnati. Now, you can't take it away from him because it happened and he's a good pass catching back. But if you look over like the final eight games of each of these two players and their production in the receiving game, it's not even close. Najee's averaging 4.3 targets a game, 3.4 receptions a game over the final eight games that he played in. Uncle Lenny, 7.4 targets per game, 6.4 receptions per game over the final eight. And then we go to the offenses, man. Again, I touched on how we don't know what the Steelers' offense is, but we do fucking know what this Tampa Bay offense is, and it's really good. They're high-paced. They pass a lot, mean more targets for him. They score a lot, more goal line opportunities for him. And if Godwin misses time, which we project him for sure to miss time, that's going to lead to more targets to the running back. Less of those short middle targets over there, more of them this way, at the line of scrimmage, behind the line of scrimmage, right? Fournette's going to take a big chunk of that. And on the contrary, the Steelers added Calvin Austin, they added George Pickens. Friar Muth is going to take a step up. Like, sure, Najee will be super involved between the 20s and in between the tackles. That doesn't mean much for fantasy, man. Don't take Najee early first round. Take Lenny end of second, early third round. And this last one, uh, I don't even think I believe in this one. So some of y'all might think that's a spicy take. I'm not good with spicy, which is why I love truff. They are the most delicious hot sauce, okay? They're they're definitely they definitely got some spice to them, but I'm someone who's kind of like, you know, I'm I'm kind of a pussy when it comes to really really hot things, which is why a nice beautiful truffle infused kick in the hot sauce is about the perfect level for me. And they have they have different hot levels. They got one with a white cap that I don't have because I've used it all and it's less hot, but the red and black starts getting very 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 hot for all you guys that are spice lovers. But they got an extremely versatile food lineup for you guys. So they have regular truffle infused hot sauce, truffle infused pasta sauce, which is incredible. If you've ever had like spicy rigatoni from a restaurant, rigatoni, however you fuckers say it, this shit, you can make it at home and it is wonderful. They've got spicy mayo. They've got truffle infused olive oil, which if you make like salads or you cook with, oh, oh, oh. Um, Truff has the single best lineup of like hot sauces. And just as a brand, they're, they're doing things correctly. If you go over to truff.com and you use our promo code, which is linked down below, you're going to get 15% off your purchase and I believe free shipping as well. So they're a luxury type of brand because they're infusing all of their food with truffle oil, which is so good, but you're getting a discount. So you're not paying luxury prices because we love them and they love us. And you can use promo code BDGE. That is linked down below. Go check out their lineup of stuff. You will find something for everyone on there. You want to give it a gift. I was a little late for Father's Day, but you can still give it and be like, you know, be like, listen, it was Father's Day. I still love you. I love you even more a week later than Father's Day. That's how you deliver a fucking gift to your father. Tell him fuck himself on Father's Day, but you love him a week later. Hit him with that Truff hot sauce box, truff.com. And let's move to this last one. And this is the spiciest take for sure out of all of them, okay? So this is a real Truff-infused, sponsored take right here. And it's A.J. Dillon. If you're going to draft A.J. Dillon, oh, y'all are going to hate me. For, I don't even know if I believe this one. I don't want to put it on record. D don't, uh, Tony, sexy, do not edit this clip for TikTok and put it up. If you're going to draft A.J. Dillon, don't. Draft Isaiah Spiller. POV, you're in a very good offense. Top five, most likely with one of the best quarterbacks in the entire NFL. There is a starting running back, smaller, explosive, really good pass catching running back in front of you. But you're a good pass catcher too, though, right? And you're bigger and you could perform on the goal line and you're probably going to get a majority of the goal line carries and you can catch those passes if you need to. And you're going to get a majority of those goal line carries because the running back in front of you is 205 pounds. Y'all might be thinking about A.J. Dillon, I'm thinking about Isaiah Spiller. Now we know Dylan's role is much more cement. We don't really know that Isaiah Spiller is the two, but we fucking know Isaiah Spiller is the two. He ain't losing a, a camp battle to Larry Roundtree. Larry fucking Roundtree? That's what I got for anyone who likes Larry Roundtree. Josh Kelly? Ain't happening either. It's Isaiah Spiller as the number two. Again, A.J. Dillon broke out a little bit last year. He's got a more secure role. I'm just saying, if you want to take the 60 pick discount on an RB2, that should get a lot of goal line carries, that has a three-down skill set, maybe you consider the rookie Isaiah Spiller on LA. I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not going to drop the mic because it's heavy and it's expensive and it wasn't really a good take to leave the video with, so I don't think you guys deserve a mic drop right now. But 
If you enjoyed the video, hopefully we deserve a thumbs up. Hopefully you subscribe to the channel if you're new. Join the Discord, as always, if you want to be in our mock drafts. And go watch Tuesday's video, Five Ways to Be a Better Fantasy Player in Five Minutes. I love you guys. Go check out Truff Hot Sauce. You will love this product. And I'll see you all tomorrow on our live stream, which, again, you will get access to via our Discord. Thank <laughs> you.